Hi there, this is Brett Lonsdale from Lightning Tools and welcome to another webinar. Uh, this webinar we're going to be taking a look at the Lightning Conductor and uh, the Lightning Conductor is a content aggregation tool uh, available for Microsoft SharePoint and um, we can use that both in, uh, in Microsoft SharePoint on-premises, uh, SharePoint online and also Microsoft Teams as well. And uh, the reason why we use the Lightning Conductor is to aggregate content whether it's coming from SharePoint lists, uh, from search results, or also from Microsoft Graph as well. So uh, let's take a look. Um, before we uh, jump into the Lightning Conductor, just a, a brief explanation as to who we are. Uh, so we are a company uh, based in the UK and also in the US, uh, name is Lightning Tools, and we provide a number of different products for both SharePoint and Teams. Uh, again, SharePoint on-prem, SharePoint online, and also uh, Microsoft Teams as well. So those products are, in different areas such as uh, permissions management, um, of course, content aggregation, which we'll be uh, taking a look at today. Uh, we also have a, an excellent uh, discussion forum tool, which can be used to uh, collaborate um, with inside forums uh, with moderators and, and so on. Uh, so you can uh, get people engaged in, in conversations throughout your organization without sort of back and forward uh, emails. Uh, we also have a list form designer and this month we've just launched our modern list form designer as well. So you can customize the look and feel of your SharePoint list forms and uh, not only uh, customize those, but also retain the uh, modern responsive design of those forms as well. And uh, we also have uh, a couple of uh, products around data connectivity, such as uh, BCS Metaman, uh, the charting tool, and uh, the data viewer, which are all geared towards connecting to different external data sources and displaying that data in different ways, whether it's through charts, grids of data, and uh, grids of data with column formatting and conditional formatting and things like that as well. So a uh, great suite of tools. You can uh, see those on lightningtools.com, and there's a, a video uh, on each product or register for another webinar because uh, we do have uh, webinars coming up on each of those products as well and um, as is always if you uh, register for a webinar you'll get the uh, the recording afterwards and so on um, also so um, myself uh, my name is Brett and uh, I founded uh, Lightning Tools back in 2007. Um, also, I'm involved in a lot of the different SharePoint community uh, side as well. So, uh, an organizer of SharePoint Saturday Leicester. Uh, we've got some good announcements coming out about that soon. Uh, we uh, also host a podcast called Tech Explaining. So, you'll be able to uh, find um, some, some recordings there where we've spoken to other Microsoft MVPs, um, also uh, Microsoft. Um, staff as well on, on different technologies and uh, also you'll find me speaking around different events uh, around the world too. So um, let's jump into content aggregation uh, first of all and uh, we just have a brief conversation as to what sort of things we can aggregate, uh, why we might want to perform some content aggregation and uh, what are the alternatives as well uh, to uh, to the Lightning Conductor, why, why would we not look at those. So. Um, Point number one, really, reasons for, uh, for for aggregating. If you consider the nature of SharePoint, when we go into Microsoft SharePoint, we've obviously got these different sites that we can create. Um, those sites, uh, if we're looking at SharePoint online, nowadays can uh, belong to uh, an association of sites. So you can have a hub site, you can also have associated sites. So you have that hub and spoke uh, topology uh, around your sites, or we can also have classic site collections uh, that can keep on growing as people create uh, new subsites uh, and, and so on as well. And each of these sites uh, all made up of different SharePoint lists and libraries. And of course, with inside those lists and libraries, we can have folders uh, in order to store the list items or documents as well. And um, sometimes it can be challenging in order to be able to find that content. And uh, of course, we have the ability to go through and use search. Uh, so we can use uh, a search term uh, in order to bring back results. Uh, but rather than searching for content, sometimes it's useful to just have some views of content that already have a result set, if that makes sense. So we'll take it tasks as an example. If uh, every single day I came in uh, to look for tasks manually, I'd need to go from one site to the next uh, in order to be able to try and find content. And that would be time consuming if I'm a member of lots of different sites in lots of different site collections or in different hub and associated sites. 
So it may take me some time to, uh, to navigate, to try and find that content. If that was a document as well, if I was looking for a specific document, that can also be frustrating because if you can't find that document, then uh, often you'll end up duplicating that content and, uh, and recreating it. Uh, and all of this is unproductive time, of course. So that's one of the, uh, the, the challenges is actually being able to find the content. And whilst you can search for it, sometimes it's more useful to log into a site, go to a particular page or go to a particular team and see all of your tasks or all of your high priority tasks or all the tasks you're going to be performing this week uh, or the documents you've worked on, uh, that type of thing, uh, all in one place. And there are web parts that come with SharePoint that can do this. Um, some of them have been around for a long, long time, especially if you use SharePoint on premises. We've got things like the content query web part or the content by search web part. And of course, we've also got the uh, highlighted content web part as well in SharePoint Online. Uh, they all tend to get you most of the way there. And, uh, and that's why the Lightning Connector really exists. If we take a look at the uh, content by query web part, it was limited to a single site collection and required you to do a lot of work in order to build a view. You had to be an XSL uh, expert to, uh, to be able to build a view of content. Um, the content by search, you uh, could go across different site collections, but you were looking at results that could be out of date because it was very dependent upon the uh, search index. And yeah, again, if you wanted to build, be able to build a view, you had to go through and build that view uh, as a display template and that again, meant getting your hands a little bit dirty in development uh, in order to, uh, to build that view. Um, and then we've got the uh, highlighted content web part, which uh, is available for SharePoint Online. It's nice and modern. You can uh, aggregate uh, from a, a single site collection or from hub and associated sites, and you can see tasks and you can see documents and things like this, but it's not customizable at all, even if you do like to get your hands dirty uh, in, in code. So that's the flexibility that the Lightning Conductor offers is the ability to aggregate the content really from anywhere. You can do it in real time using the object model. You can also do it using search. Uh, so you uh, get the performance um, of, uh, of search results and you can build a view without having to write any code at all. So you can just simply pick and choose which columns you want to see, what order you want those in, how do you want to group, how do you want to apply formatting, uh, such as conditional formatting and so on. Again, and that can be done without code as well. So perhaps highlighting some of the uh, content that's most important to you because it's uh, becoming overdue or it's uh, a high priority task, or again, it's a document you created or, or something like this, you can apply those conditions uh, in order to highlight that content and be able to see it more easily, have it jump out at you. So aggregating content helps the business users to be able to find uh, the content they're looking for. They can see that all in one place. Um, and we can also have it refine uh, to the current user as well. So they can use some of the different filters to be able to see what is relevant to them uh, as an individual, rather than just seeing content that is relevant to everybody that might uh, access the site. So these are some of the reasons. And um, like I say, the reason for the Lightning Conductor, um, first of all, it's really simple to use, uh, as you'll find out in just a moment when we jump into it. So business users can configure the Lightning Conductor uh, without the need from developers or consultants. Uh, they can configure this themselves using a quick, easy configuration. But it also has the ability to take it that step further if you want to. So if you did want to uh, create something that is um, very specific to your needs, it steps away from the grid view, uh, you can have the ability to build display templates with things like JSON and, and so on as well. Uh, so you can build a, a completely different view um, that uh, is very specific to, uh, to your needs. And we have some of those views uh, already built as well into the web part that you can use today, things like a, a calendar view or a uh, Gantt view, or we've also got uh, a tile view for documents. You can make the content stand out, as I mentioned, using uh, colors and icons and things like that, and build your own conditions. We're not just tied to SharePoint lists or search as well, which um, helps with the Lightning Connector. We can also go and get content throughout Microsoft 365 using the Microsoft Graph. And if you're interested, um, on February the, uh, the 19th, I believe it is, um, We've, uh, we've got a webinar coming up with Jeremy Thake, who is actually one of the product managers for Microsoft Graph and uh, for Microsoft. And he's going to be introducing Microsoft Graph and what the capabilities of Microsoft Graph are. And basically, you'll find that Microsoft Graph is used throughout 
Microsoft 365. So in instances where, for example, you go into Outlook and you click onto that to field to look at one of your colleagues, it's Microsoft Graph and the people entity that is actually powering that uh, lookup from the different people inside your organization. Um, there's uh, there's lots of different areas, like I say, throughout Microsoft 365 that use Microsoft Graph today, and it's is forming the basis of, of how you query data uh, across uh, SharePoint, but also across Teams and, and and so on as well. So we can actually go and get that same content using the Lightning Conductor. We can go and bring in planner tasks or messages or users or groups, uh, all of this without, again, having to write a single line of code. You can basically just go through and choose which entity you want to look at and uh, and configure how you want that query to uh, to be, what columns you want to see, and so on. Uh, it also works with the hub sites and associated sites. You can build the reports on a SharePoint page or on a Microsoft Team tab. Um, and we also get uh, very high performance without any throttling issues uh, and so on as well, which is great. And finally, um, we're also code quality certified. So uh, this is not a web part that uh, is just added to the web store. We've also got uh, code quality certification um, to ISO standards as well, uh, which is quite important when you're putting a third party product into your uh, tenant or your SharePoint farm. So let's take a look. Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, everything else is going to be a demonstration and um, we will also have the opportunity for Q&A at the end of the, uh, the webinar as well. So what I'm going to do first of all is just um, alt tab into my SharePoint page. So here we are and uh, we've got a new page that has been created um, just a nicer heading. That's the only change that's been made. We've not yet added the uh, the web part. So what I'm going to do is add the web part to the page. So we can click onto the plus icon and perform a search for the Lightning Conductor. So as we start typing, we can see here there's the Lightning Conductor. Just uh, one simple click, we get the Lightning Conductor on the page and we can start to work with it. So there's two modes that the Lightning Conductor works in. Uh, we have like a simple mode for uh, for configuration. We've also got an advanced mode. So when I click onto the configure button, you'll see here it jumps straight into this quick configuration. And uh, this is something that any user can basically go through very, very quickly, get some content on the page and start to customize the look and feel of that content. What we've done is we've built in some of the more common types of query that our users like to see. So we tend to find that uh, a lot of our customer bases are aggregating documents, they're aggregating tasks, announcements, and things like that, um, as well as also having the capability of aggregating content from a custom list or a custom content type. So in the drop down here, we uh, we address a lot of those. Um, so as you can see, we've got documents, we've got tasks, we have events, announcements, messages, and users, and these two are actually coming from Microsoft Graph. Uh, whereas uh, announcements, events, tasks, and documents, uh, they could be coming from search or from the object model. And you've got the uh, the option of choosing which uh, as we go through this quick configuration. So I'm going to start off with tasks. It's something that uh, everybody, I think, can uh, adhere to. Uh, so we'll select tasks. Um, the next question is, how do we want to refine it? So do we want to see all of the tasks within uh, a certain scope, or do we want to have some pre built filters and some of those filters are filtering on who the task is assigned to so we can have a, a pre-built view called my tasks um, we've also got my overdue tasks as well so obviously based on that due date uh, if the due date has passed and it's assigned to me uh, then we can see all of those tasks in one place in one view so I'm going to start off with all tasks so no filter whatsoever it's just going to return all of the tasks from the given scope that I tell it to, uh, to go against. And that's the third question here is where do we want that content to come from? So in the drop down, we could just display it from the current site that we're in. Uh, we can choose this site and any subsite. We can choose the current site collection, which would be the entire site collection if we were using a, a classic site collection. Uh, we could choose this site and associated sites. That's great for the hub spoke uh, type of topology that we have. And we've also got current tenant as well. So that will be the entire tenant, all of the site collections, all of the hub and uh, spoke sites as well uh, included in that. And uh, at the bottom here, you will also see we've got similar scopes, so current site, current site collection, current tenant, but using the search engine. So 
the top half of this drop down is all going to be real time results. The benefit of that, if somebody changes a task from in progress to completed, we're going to see that result straight away. Um, it will change, as I say, in, in real time. Whereas if we're using the search, this is better for uh, large uh, resource sources or, or large, uh, large lists where we really want to have optimal performance. Um, and the, uh, the real-time results are not that important to us. So if we're aggregating uh, some like documents and um, the search index is maybe an hour old or, or a couple of hours old, if that doesn't really matter, we're gonna be able to see all of those documents very, very quickly uh, using the, uh, the search engine. So we'll have a look at both of those. Uh, what I'll start off with is just the current site collection. I'm gonna select that. So we've simply got tasks, all tasks from the current site collection. And then the final choice is how do I want to see those? So we can display them in a grid view. We can also display them in a calendar view. And you'll see that this will differ based on what type of list data we want to go against. So if we were to choose documents, for example, uh, let's just switch to that for a moment. You can see I've got a grid view or a tile view where we're actually previewing the first page of the document with inside a tile. Uh, if we were to uh, work with events again, we get the calendar view and, and so on. So there's some of those built-in views, uh, but let's just leave it as it was. So tasks, all tasks from the current site collection in a grid view and we'll hit save. So that's really all we needed to do to get started. And as you can see, we've now got a number of different tasks coming from the current site collection uh, on our page here that we can start to work with. Now we've gone and added the most common columns to the view. So people do want to see the task name, of course. Uh, they want to see who the task is assigned to, what the status is, the priority when it's due, and the percentage complete. But you can go through and customize all of this with inside the grid view itself. So one of the things we might want to do simply is to add another column. So what we can do is hit the drop down on any of the existing columns, come down here to column settings, we have show column, and this will then display all of the task related columns. So we're not seeing all of the Microsoft 365 columns like you will do with some of the web parts. Um, this is showing me just anything that is relevant to the task lists within the scope that I'm querying. So, uh, so in here we have start date, and that is the task start date. So we can select that, and we've now got that start date showing in our view, as well as the due date. Now we might want that to appear before the due date, so we can just hit the drop down again and under the column settings we have this move left, uh, so we can uh, move that left until it's uh, where we want it to appear. So we've now got the start date and then the due date uh, before the percentage complete in here. Now there is some conditional formatting already applied to this view as well, so we can see uh, a, a pink colour, <laughs> which is the um, tasks that are coming up. Uh, very, very soon uh, for uh, for the due date. And then we've got some that are a little bit further out, uh, which are in green. Uh, if we had some that were overdue, they would show in red and so on. But we can customize that conditional formatting and um, we can also apply it to other columns as well. So what we uh, are gonna do here is actually take a look at the priority column. As you can see, we've got um, some tasks that are high priority, others that are normal priority and uh, some are low priority and so on. So I want these to jump out at me. So if they are a high priority task, I see that quite clearly and uh, we can then pay attention to those first. So I'm gonna hit the, uh, the drop down on the priority column, come down to the column settings and we'll go to formatting. And in here, we can basically go through and apply our condition. So we'll have priority equals high. And in the drop down there, we're actually rendering all of the choices so I can choose the uh, the high priority value and if it is a high priority if it does meet this condition then we can choose what that formatting is going to look like and the formatting can be applied to the current row only um, or we can apply it to the to the cell so I'm going to leave it to the cell we could change the uh, for color or the background color so we've got the options of doing that so the, the text or the actual cell color and the default is to actually just give us the option of uh, choosing the theme color. So notice we're getting that purple, which is the theme that I'm using on this modern site, um, but I can override that completely and actually choose any color I like. Um, and we've also got that palette there for the most recent colors that we were choosing. So we can go through and apply a color. Um, we've also got the ability to change the alignment, uh, the justification of the, the content. 
based on the condition. Uh, we can change the font, so we can make it bold, italic, underline, that sort of thing. Um, and we've also got the ability to assign an icon as well. And there's lots of different icons in here. So notice as we scroll to the right, we can see all sorts of icons uh, that we can select from and you can search on those as well. So uh, we can search on the word car and it will bring back an icon for a car and so on as well. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna use a dot and we'll take that dot and we'll change the color of that dot. So if it's a high priority task, we perhaps want that to stand out. So we'll choose a bright color red and uh, apply that, we'll save that color. We can change the size of the dot. Uh, we could display just the dot rather than the value, uh, the value being the word high. And we can also choose whereabouts we want that to be positioned. Uh, so I'll have that on the left-hand side. So we'll, uh, we'll select save on that one. Now I'm also gonna add two more conditions in here as well. So you can add as many of those as you like. Um, so uh, of course we want to show another dot that um, might be a sort of amber color and we'll do that for a normal priority task so we'll have the condition set to normal and finally for low priority let's set that to a green and you know any demonstration has to have the most ghastly color green you can possibly find so we'll select that one and uh, again choose save and set the condition to be low so uh, now we've got our condition set, we've got our icon set, we can hit save, and as you can see now, we've got that conditional formatting uh, without any code at all applied to that column, and we can very easily see those high priority tasks that need our attention versus the low priority ones. So that's applying conditional formatting within the view. Um, we've also got the ability to create things like data bars as well. So on the right hand side here where we've got the percentage complete, again, it's not jumping out at us, which tasks are completed, which ones are not. Uh, so I can hit the drop down on that one, come down to the column settings again, once more into formatting. And uh, this is not based on a condition, so I'm actually gonna remove that condition. And as said, we're gonna display a data bar. Now the maximum value for the percentage complete, being a decimal that is formatted as a percentage uh, is one. So 50% is 0 0.5 and, and so on. So the maximum value we can be is one. So I'm gonna set that as my maximum value. And we can again choose a color or have it detect the theme. So uh, it's nice to detect the theme and then it looks like it belongs on this page. And uh, we can also show or hide the underlying value as well. So if it doesn't really matter to us that this is actually 40%, we just see that it's you know, roughly 40%, then we can actually hide that value and uh, it will just show you the bar itself. So as we save that now, notice how we've now got that percentage complete column showing and uh, we can very clearly see which of those tasks are more complete than others that have only just started the progress uh, as we go through those. The other thing we can do is grouping. So um, one of the things I might want to group by is things like the task status or who the task is assigned to, uh, things like that. So under the task status here, we'll go down to uh, the column settings and click on group by. And that's all we need to do. Um, so doing that, I've now got my groups created. So all of my completed tasks are together. As we scroll down, we've got the in progress tasks and the not started tasks, and we can uh, expand and collapse those sections uh, in order to be able to see the content that we're looking for. Uh, we do take it more than one level. So if you also wanted to group by user, um, after you've grouped by the uh, task status, you can do, so grouping by user, notice how we've got the completed tasks by demo user one and then demo user two and uh, and so on. So it becomes a much better way of uh, being able to see that content uh, within inside the view here. Okay, so let's take it to another level. You'll notice on the right hand side of my screen where I've got the lightning conductor tasks pane, um, in there we've got this view called default, which um, we're going to give a better name to. We're going to call that all tasks. And I'm then going to go through and create another view. So I can click onto the plus icon here and that creates another view for me. And what I'm going to do is, uh, sorry, just change the order of that one, which I can do by dragging and dropping. And what I'm going to do with this one is uh, call it all tasks in a calendar. So um, to configure the new view, I'm just going to click onto this cog icon again. 
Once more, we'll choose tasks, all tasks from the current site collection. And this time we'll show it in a calendar view. So as I hit save, we've got that view created and notice in the top left hand corner, the end user can select how they want to see the tasks, either in this calendar view, where they've got a day, week and uh, a month view, um, or they can uh, see the tasks inside a grid view. So they've got the, uh, the option of how they want to view that content uh, within there. Okay, so that's uh, some of the things that we can do with, uh, with tasks. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other types of query that we might want to build. Um, so when we hit the plus icon again, I'm gonna click onto the, uh, the cog here and show you that we can go and get things from the Microsoft Graph. Uh, a useful place to go is the Graph Explorer. Uh, so if you Google Graph Explorer uh, or Microsoft Graph Explorer, uh, with that, you'll be able to go through and test the sort of things that you can build using Microsoft Graph. Uh, but what I want to show you is how we can get to things like users or messages uh, and things like that. So we'll select the, uh, the users. These are security trimmed as well uh, natively, so you don't have to worry about any security issues using Microsoft Graph. But here we'll select users. I can choose um, whether I want to show all users or guest users. So that's your external users. Uh, let's go with uh, all users. And of course the data is coming from the Microsoft Graph in a grid view, so we can hit save. And that has built this uh, new view for me, which I didn't name yet. So let's just go to it and then we can give it a name. So we'll just call that uh, Microsoft 365 users. Okay, so we've now got a list of of users and um, you can see that some of those are guests. So there's my brett.lonsdale at gmail.com. Uh, I can see that as a guest user and uh, the others are members of, uh, of the SharePoint tenant. So we've got uh, a number of different demo users and so on in there as well. And the exact same thing applies to what you saw when we did a list aggregation versus a graph uh, aggregation. You can show and hide the different columns. So this is actually going and showing all of the different properties about the user that we could display with inside this view. So in here, we've got things like what city they are belonging to, what company name, what country, department, et cetera, uh, based on that information that uh, is inside their, their user profile. So uh, we can go through and select those and they would become additional columns with inside the view here. Uh, you can do the conditional formatting, you can do all of the grouping uh, and so on in exactly the same way. So if we wanted to group by the uh, user type column. Here we've got a section of all of our guest users and then a section of all of our SharePoint members. Okay, so, uh, so that's a little bit of graph. Um, we can also go through and using this quick configuration, display some documents. So um, again, they're refined different ways. We've got all documents, my documents, my checked out documents. Uh, so again, it's a, just a simple case of choosing where that content is gonna come from. What I'd like to do for that one is actually jump into the advanced mode. So whilst we can do it inside the quick configuration, uh, let's take a, a moment to, uh, to have a look at the advanced mode and see what we can do in there. So in here, we've got uh, a choice of different configuration providers. So as I mentioned, you've got search, you have the object model, and also the graph rollup engine provider, depending on what type of query you want to do. So with the object model, um, once we've decided that's how we want to go and get the data, we want the data to be in real time. That's why we would choose the object model. Uh, we could then select how do we want to display the results, uh, either in a quick, easy configuration uh, of the grid view, like you have already seen, or you've also got some built-in JSON providers. The calendar is an example of that. Uh, we've also got some XSLT uh, providers as well that we can use. So if we were to choose the grid view, um, we get to select all the columns that we want to see and things like that. If it's a JSON view or an XSLT view, we actually choose which view we want to create and they're pre-built for us, although you can go through and customize those too. So uh, that's the object model for the grid view display provider. And then we can go to the data source tab. Um, notice that this returns uh, different sites organized into the site collections. So we can navigate those in order to get to the content that we want to query. Um, or we can uh, also choose different types of views. So if I wanted to be a little bit more granular than that, uh, let me just show you how we can navigate these uh, down to sites. So I can pick and choose which 
which sites I want to uh, aggregate from. But if I was to say I want to actually go down to the list level, now the actual lists are being returned as well. So I can select individual lists and, and aggregate those. Okay, so that's uh, querying from the uh, from the object model. Um, we basically just choose that and then we can choose the content type and so on that we want to use uh, in order to get results back. Um, but let's also go through and have a look at the search role it provided. So if we're using search with the grid view, when we go to the data source tab, that changes. So no longer are we expanding or collapsing uh, a tree view in order to be able to get to the content. Uh, what we can do is actually use a search result source. So what I'm going to do here is actually bring back items matching a content type. So often when you're um, building your lists and libraries, you can create different content types, uh, but there's also the out of the box content types as well. And in here, we've got the query text. So it's basically looking for a list item or a document. Uh, so we can uh, leave it like that, or we could just trim out the list item bit and just leave it as document. It doesn't really matter. Um, but since I said I want to match a content type under the query template variables here, it's actually asking me which content type I want to work with. And uh, what we can do is go through and select the content type. So in here, I could select the document content type. That's the one that I want to work with. I can go and set the scope so I can tell it which site collection or just leave that blank if I want to and so on. So once I've defined that, I can uh, jump into the columns view. And uh, this is slightly different here because uh, whilst you can customize it afterwards inside the grid view, uh, when you're in the advanced mode, this is our view to work with. We can go through and select which columns we want to see from the search results. Uh, so in here, we've got things like the uh, title or the uh, the name of the document is something that we could also choose. Uh, so we could go through and choose title and things like size, maybe the site name that it belongs to, who the author was, and things like that. And you can drag those columns around so that you can get the order right uh, in the grid view. So you can have the title as being the leftmost column followed by the author and so on. Um, we can do sorting, filtering, and so on from here. Uh, through here, we've also got some other bits and pieces. Um, so if you're exporting the content, you can choose whether or not to export this column and what's the export format when it goes into Excel, uh, things like that we can go through and, and set. And under the display tab is where we can also do things like the display formatting. So we might want to format this um, to hide the file extension, uh, the author, we can have a hyperlink to them or render their picture. Uh, things like this. Uh, we've also got the size that we could put in megabytes, kilobytes, or gigabytes, and, and what have you, and, and basically customize the, uh, the look and feel of it from there. Uh, you have the number of items per page you want to show, where you want those pagination controls to be, um, a message perhaps if no results are shown, then you can uh, perhaps say there are no documents inside this scope. And you've also got things like the uh, sticky headers that you can turn on. So as you scroll down, uh, you'll still be able to see the headers uh, for each of the different columns. So that's some of the refinement that we can do on the view. And when we hit save, you'll notice here that we've got that new view one. I, again, I didn't uh, name it, uh, but there's the, uh, the new view. So using search, we've got uh, all of the different documents. You can see there's 31 pages of documents with the author and the size set. So that can also be done not just using the advanced mode. The advanced mode just gives you more granular control over it. Uh, but what we can actually do using the quick configuration is uh, is use search as well. So I can say from the uh, or from the current tenant, if I want to, uh, I want to bring back all the documents. And um, if we hit save on that, there we go. Uh, we've got uh, 82 pages of documents returned instantly. And uh, it also renders the folders as well, so we can expand collapse those uh, in order to be able to see the content and, and how it's been organized. So uh, again, uh, we could apply conditional formatting and, and so on to this view. Uh, if we just go and create one more, uh, what I actually just want to do is point out the graph capabilities and how we would use that. So jumping into the advanced mode, we can select the graph roll-up provider here. Uh, again, we can choose how we want to display it. 
the data source. So this time we've actually got all of these different data sources available to you. See, so the users one, for example, was just that. The entity type was set to user, and then you can set a, a query timeout, an item limit, and so on. Add your query if you want to. Uh, we've also got things like the planner tasks, uh, calendar items, messages, OneDrive items, things like this that we can go through and query uh, using the graph and then build out the columns as we want to see them from the graph. So for this one particular uh, instance, we've got users again. As you've already seen, we've got things like the, you know, the higher date, um, the country that the user belongs to, things like that. And uh, once again, those results would be security trimmed as you go through and build your view. <clears throat> okay, so um, that's the Lightning Conductor in SharePoint. And uh, what I just want to show you is we've got the exact same thing available for Teams as well. So if we uh, just pop to another page here, let's just go to our home page. Sorry, I had this all ready to go. Do, 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 do. Uh, for some reason, lost my uh, waffle, but never mind. Uh, let's just go in this way. Jump into Teams. There we go. <clears throat> Okay, so we're in Teams, and um, inside of Microsoft Teams, what we can do is click onto this plus icon uh, to add a tab. And this will show you a number of different uh, SPFX web parts that you can add as a tab in Teams. Uh, and one of them here is the Lightning Conductor. So we can select that, um, add it onto the page. So it just takes a, a moment to go through and add that tab. We uh, we hit save. It will post to the channel. So under posts, it will tell everybody I've added the Lightning Conductor tab. You can go through and have a look at it. And on that Lightning Conductor tab, uh, we get that same configuration. So I can click configure with inside Microsoft Teams. I can go through and choose the uh, type of content I want to bring back. Uh, so again, if we choose to choose tasks from current site collection in a grid view, hit save. We have those tasks displayed there as well. So we can aggregate results, um, again, not just from SharePoint lists uh, with powerful views, um, but also from each of the, uh, the other channels as well. So um, from things like graph and, uh, and search as well, we can, uh, we can bring back those results. and display those here uh, with inside the uh, Teams interface. OK, so at that point, um, I'll open up for questions. I think I've uh, shown each of the different features of the Lightning Conductor. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can use the chat window and, uh, and type your, your question. Or if you prefer, uh, you can raise your hand using the GoToWebinar software. I can unmute you, and uh, you can ask your question. So over to you if you, uh, if you do have any questions. Okay, actually not seeing any questions or raised hands. So um, what you can do if you think of something after the event, uh, please email me. Uh, so you can email me on brett at lightningtools.com. Uh, so brett at lightningtools.com. If you do have a question that comes to mind, drop me an email. We'll be happy to uh, answer it. And uh, like I say, if you're also interested in attending uh, the Graph webinar, we'll go into Graph in a lot more detail uh, on that webinar. So you can register for that one by going to lightningtools.com. And under webinars, uh, that's where you're going to find this webinar uh, once it's uh, it's been produced. Um, but you'll also find that we've got the uh, webinar with Jeremy Thake on Wednesday, the 19th of February. Uh, he's going to be talking about graph and what the capabilities of graph are. 
and uh, you'll also be able to see the lightning conductor in there as well with some more uh, graph configurations. Okay, thank you very much for attending.